Welcome everybody to my latest video. So for this video, obviously we're doing something a little bit different. And I'm going to be talking to you about, um, well, this is just a video about some memories I had regarding an old video game store. Now back in the day, most of us got our games from, you know, Toys R Us, KB Toy Store, etc. Uh, there's this one place that I found, and I don't think it exists anymore. At least not in the form that I remember it. Um, if it's the same place, I think all they do is like arcade monitor repair. But there was a store, it was called P&L Video Games. Now this place was amazing. Um, it was just ran by this uh, guy, I think his name was John. And... Um, Little Chinese guy, probably weighed about 110, you know, five foot two. Um, the store, it was started off really small, and they got um, they moved to a, a bigger facility. We're not talking, you know, the size of KB Toy Stores or Toys R Us, anything like that. No, um, but it was a mom and pop store, and this place, like, yeah, it was just amazing. Now. When you would go inside, yeah, you'd have uh, the latest games. Um, uh, let's see. I was going to this place probably around the time between the TurboGrafx-16 and the Sega Saturn, maybe PlayStation era. So, yeah, quite a few years. Now... Yeah, you go inside and, you know, you got all your your regular um, Super Nintendo, Genesis, Sega Saturn, stuff like that. But this place imported stuff. And at the time, th this was stuff you never saw. You got to remember, there was no internet back then. So seeing things of this nature was just unimaginable. I mean, I would walk in and I would see... Um, vinyl toys of Sailor Moon dolls or Sailor Moon figures and Dragon Ball Z. And at the time, nobody knew what the hell that was. Um, some of you may not still not know what uh, Sailor Moon is. Um, it did have some popularity, but like Dragon Ball Z, now it's a phenomenon. Um, back then, nobody ever heard of it. Nobody knew quite what it was for those who had heard of it. But yeah, there's all these Dragon Ball Z toys. And this place would have game systems that you've never even seen before. Um, stuff that was only released in Japan. And, of course, Toys R Us, um, KB's, Electronics Boutique. Uh, I think Electronics Boutique uh, was an EB Games. Places like that, they would never sell this stuff. The closest thing you would see in any of those type stores, um, which would seem odd would be a Neo Geo. Uh, this place, they had uh, the Super Graphics, the PCFX, they had um, FM Towns Marty, all these systems that nobody had, a, you know, had any clue existed. Now, the thing about this place also, back then, games and systems didn't come out around the same time for the United States and Japan. Um, for example, the Nintendo 64, I think that came out in America like a year after it came out in Japan. So at that time, you know, you try and get a Nintendo 64 or, you know, you wanted to get a Nintendo 64, you would have had to wait. However, this place had the Japanese versions and they were there in stock and selling. And it was just amazing the price difference. Um... The U.S. Nintendo 64, I think, was, was it 250 maybe? Um, or you get the Japanese version from P&L Video Games, and it was like 550 But it was in stock. You wouldn't have to wait. So it was things like that that was just amazing. Um, another story. When Street Fighter 2 came out on the Super Nintendo, for those of you who remember, that was a mega event. And I was the first one of all my friends, um, maybe even in the entire school, or at least the grade, that had Street Fighter 2. And the reason is, is I got the Famicom version, you know, the Japanese version, 
And I had it months and months and months before anybody else. And I got it from this place. Uh, funny story is, I won the game so bad, I sold some of my other games. I went, I got it. It was amazing. Um, but here's the thing. I got it. And this is another reason why I, why I like this place. I got the Famicom cart, brought it home, tried to put it in my Super Nintendo. It, it wouldn't fit in. Now we know why, but back then, you know, you know what the hell's going on? So I call the place up, and they're like, oh yeah, you know, um, you know, I just bought this uh, Super Nintendo uh, Street Fighter 2, and it can't fit into my Super Nintendo. What's going on? And the guy's like, oh, you know, yeah, just come on back down here. And he said something, heavy accent. I really couldn't remember him. So I got my grandfather to take me back down uh, to the place. And I go in and, you know, hey, man, what's up? How I just spent over 100 bucks on this game. I can't play it. And, you know, the guy's telling me, he's like, well, yeah, you need a converter. An adapter so that uh, this Japanese game can play in your United States Super Nintendo and I, I had no money left. I'm like, oh, f man. And he's like, you know, if you want the adapter, we'll sell it to you. It's, you know, we got it here. It's 25 bucks. Or just bring back your Super Nintendo and I'll modify it for free. So I went back. I uh, had my grandfather. Uh, this is over where my grandfather lived. So I would spend like the summers with him or vacations, my grandparents. Bless his heart for going back and forth multiple times to the store in a single day within a single hour. You know, so I went back, got my Super Nintendo, brought it back over there. And as you know, the Super Nintendo, to play Famicom games, you just uh, break out of a couple tabs, plastic tabs. And this guy, you know, they were doing it for free. Yeah, you purchase the game here, we'll, we'll break these tabs off for free. Or you can buy the adapter. And that was so cool about this place, you know. They could have forced their consumers to buy uh, the adapter and not tell them that they can modify the Super Nintendo for free, but... They did, and that won my respect for them so much. And again, around the time of Street Fighter 2, you walk in, and they had the Super Nintendo playing Street Fighter 2 hooked up to like two or three TVs side by side. I had never seen anything like that before. I mean, all three uh, screens were put together to make one giant screen. They had... A custom or a yeah, a customized homemade arcade stick, and you look at that. And back then, that didn't exist. Uh, now you got uh, all these sorts of arcade sticks. You know, um, well, you know, Mad Cats went under, but you know, back then all you had was you know the stuff that you would get for the Super Nintendo, which sucked and looked nothing like um, what you would see at the arcades. And this place would sell them. Two-player uh, arcade control panel for your Super Nintendo, two hundred and fifty dollars. And it's all this stuff that I wish I could get. I never had the money, and I never would have the money around that time. But it was just so awesome to see, and it was amazing. Um, but yeah, I really, really love going to this place. They had a trade system. Now you know nowadays. When you have a game you want to, you know, trade in at GameStop, they don't give you jack shit for it. Um, sorry about that, I had to cut away. Uh, but as I was saying, you know, if you have a, nowadays, you have a game you want to trade in at GameStop, you go there, they give you hardly anything for it. Um, there was no direct trading. It was, you know, you, you sell GameStop your game. They give you credit and, you know, you pray eventually you'll have enough to buy what you want. This place had a very unique and weird, um, trading system and it was all run by the owner. So I'm just going to use for an example, cause around the, it's around the time I remember and the games I remember, uh, the Sega Saturn. At one time, Virtual Fire 2 was a huge, huge uh, game being sold for the Saturn. So you would go in, you'd see a used, uh, you know, um, you'd see a used copy of Virtual Fire 2. And you're like, yeah, I got this game, you know, some obscure title that, you know, you know you're not going to get much for and you wish you didn't get it. 
And you tell them, hey, I want to trade this game for that Virtual Fighter 2. And, you know, what, how about it? So the salesperson would then call uh, the, the owner. And, you know, hey, he's always working in there. He wants to trade this for this. How much? And the guy, you know, John or whatever his name was would yell over, okay, uh, $35 or $25, $30, whatever. And so, yeah, you do the trade and they would trade you as long as you paid an additional X amount. Or vice versa. Maybe you had a Virtual Fighter 2 and you were done playing with it and you wanted to buy this other game that, you know, it was pretty cheap. Not too many people wanted it. And, you know, hey, how much for a trade? Oh, okay, uh, trade it and $5. So he was very fair, and it was a very awesome way to trade games, because you could buy a game, and you know you didn't like it, okay, you go back and um, trade another one. I think there may have been some sort of a, where if you bought a used game there, that was priced under like 30 bucks, you bought it, you could take it home, and then if you didn't like it within 24 hours, you could bring it back and trade it for another one, another game valued at the same price or less for only like $5. So th that was kind of unique. But yeah, this place, uh, I really wish it still existed. Um, but just places like this don't exist anymore in America or, or very, very rarely. But yeah, and it was... Um, so I just thought I'd share this story of this place, uh, P&L Video Games. Like I said, I don't think they exist anymore. Um, they may still exist, but in a different format. I don't know. But yeah, just some memories I had of this place. Really, really awesome. Um, yeah, well, that's it. So hopefully you enjoyed this video, a little trip down memory lane. Uh, my personal memory lane. And um, if you didn't, oh well. So there you are. Until next time. That's it, man. Game over, man. It's game over. <laughs>